Good evening. Well, it's Wednesday and it's six o'clock and that means it's time for Tales and Cocktails once again. Tonight we have a piece <clears throat> which I've just recently come across, which I'd never known before, a piece by James Thurber. <coughs> Excuse me. Oh, the pollen is wild. <laughs> In uh, Notes on Contributors to the New Yorker, we find James Thurber, <clears throat> 1894 to 1961, was born in Columbus, Ohio, and joined the New Yorker in 1927 as an editor and writer. His idiosyncratic cartoons began to appear there four years later. <clears throat> His books include two children's classics, The Thirteen Clocks and The Wonderful O, and a memoir of his time at the New Yorker, The Years with Ross. He also co-wrote a successful play, The Male Animal, and appeared in A Thurber Carnival, a miscellany of his works that was adapted for the stage. In 1947, The Secret Life of Walter Mitty was made into a film starring Danny Kaye. Now tonight's, tonight's piece by James Thurber is How to Name a Dog. Let me clear this out of the way so I can get the light properly on. There, all right. Excuse me. Every few, few months, somebody writes me and asks if I will give him a name for his dog. Several of these correspondents in the past year have wanted to know if I would mind the use of my own name for their spaniels. Spaniel writers or spaniel owners seem to have the notion that a person could sue for invasion of privacy or defamation of character if his name is applied to a cocker without written permission. And one gentleman even insisted that we conduct our correspondence in the matter through a notary public. I have a way of letting communications of this sort fall behind my roll top desk. But it has, re it has recently occurred to me that this is an act of evasion if not indeed of plain cowardice. I have therefore decided to come straight out with the simple truth, that it is as hard for me to think up a name for a dog as it is for anybody else. The idea that I was an expert in the business is probably the outcome of a piece I wrote several years ago in cautiously revealing the fact that I have owned 40 or more dogs in my lifetime. This is true, but is also deceptive. All but five or six of my dogs were disposed of when they were puppies. And I had not gone to the trouble of giving to these impermanent residents of my house any names at all except, hey, you, and cut that out and let go. Names of dogs end up in 176th place in the list of things that amaze and fascinate me. Canine cognomens should be designed to impinge on the ears of the dogs and not to amuse neighbors, tradespeople, and casual visitors. I remember a few dogs from the past with a faint but lingering pleasure. A farmhound named Rain a roving Airedale named Marco Polo, a female bull, ter bull terrier known as Stephanie Brody because she liked to jump from moving motor cars and second story windows, and a peak called Darien. But that's about all. The only animals whose naming demands concentration, hard work, and ingenuity are the seeing eye dogs. They have to be given unusual names because passers-by like to call to seeing eyes, here, sport, or yo, rags, or don't take any wooden nickels, Rin Tin Tin. A blind man's dog with an ordinary name would continually be distracted from its work. A tyro at naming these dogs might make the mistake of picking DeRocher of Keef Tallow. The former is too much like Rover, and the latter could easily sound like here fellow to a dog. Speaking of puppies, as I was a while back, 
I feel that I should warn inexperienced dog owners who have discovered to their surprise, to their surprise and dismay, a dozen puppies in a hall closet or under the floors of the barn, not to give them away. Sell them or keep them, but don't give them away. 60% of persons who have given a dog for nothing bring him back sooner or later and plump him into the reluctant and unprepared lap of his former owner. The people say that they are going to Florida and can't take the dog, or that he doesn't want to go. Or they point out that he eats first editions, or lace curtains, or spinets, or that he doesn't see eye to eye with them in the matter of housebreaking, or that he makes disparaging remarks under his breath about their friends. Anyway, they bring him back, and you are stuck with him, and maybe six others. But if you charge 10 or even $5 for pups, the new owners don't dare return them. They're afraid to ask for their money back because they believe you might think they're hard up and need the 5 or $10. Furthermore, when a mischievous puppy is returned to its former owner, it invariably behaves beautifully. And the persons who brought it back are likely to be regarded as imbecile, imbeciles or dog haters, or both. Names of dogs, to get back to our subject, have a range almost as wide as that of the violin. They run from such plain and simple names as Spot, Sport, Rex, Brownie, and Rover, all originated by small boys, to such effete and fancy appellations as Prince Rudolf Hettenberg Gratzheim of Darndorf Putzelhorst and Darling Mist of Love the Third of Heather Light Holyrood, names originated by adults, all of whom in every other way, I am told, have made a normal adjustment to life. In addition to the plain and the fancy categories, there are the cynical and the coy. Cynical names are given by people who do not like dogs too much. The most popular cynical names during the war were Mussolini, Tojo, and Adolf. I never have been able to get very far in my exploration of the minds of people who called their dogs Mussolini, Tojo, and Adolf. And I suspect the reason is that I am unable to associate with them long enough to examine what goes on in their heads. I nod and I tell them the time of day if they ask, and that is all. I never vote for them or ask them to have a drink. The great coy category is perhaps the largest. The coy people call their dogs Bubbles and Boggles and Sparkles and Twinkles and Doodles and Puffy and Lovums and Sweetums and Itsy Bitsy and Betsy Bye Bye and Sugarkins. I pass these dog owners at a dog trot wearing a horrible fixed grin. There is a special subdivision of the coys that is not quite so awful, but awful enough. These people, whom we will call the Wits, own two dogs, which they name Pitter and Patter, Willie and Nilly, Helter and Skelter, Namby and Pamby, Hugger and Mugger, Hokery and Pokery, and even Wishy and Washy, Ups and Daisy, Fitz and Starts, Fish and Fetch and Carry, and Pro and Connie. Then there is the cryptic category. These people select names for some private reason or for no reason at all, except perhaps to amuse the visitor's curiosity, to arouse the visitor's curiosity, so that he will exclaim, why in the world do you call your dog that? The cryptics name their dogs October, Bennett's Aunt, 315, Doc Nose, Tuesday, Home Fried, Opus 38, Ask Leslie, and thanks for the home run, Emile. I make it a point simply to pat these unfortunate dogs on the head, ask no questions of their owners, 
and go about my business. This article has degenerated into a piece that probably should be entitled How Not to Name a Dog. I was afraid it would. It seems only fair to make up for this by confessing a few of the names I have given my own dogs, with the considerable help, if not indeed, <laughs> the insistence of their mistress. Most of my dogs have been females, and they have answered with apparent gladness to such names as Jeannie, Tessa, Julie, and Sophie. Sophie is a black French poodle whose kennel name was Christabel, but she never answered to Christabel, which she considers as foolish a name for a dog as Pamela, Jennifer, Clarissa, Jacqueline, Guinevere, and Shelmerdine. Sophie is opposed, and I am also, to Ida, Ira, Ida, Cora, Blanche, and Myrtle. About six years ago, when I was looking for a house to buy in Connecticut, I knocked on the front door of an attractive home whose owner, my real estate agent had told me, wanted to sell in order to go back to Iowa to live. The lady agent who escorted me around had informed me that the owner of this place was a man named Strong. But a few minutes after arriving at the house, I was having a drink in the living room with Phil Stong, for it was he. We went out into the yard after a while, and I saw Mr. Stong's spaniel. I called to the dog and snapped my fingers, but he seemed curiously embarrassed, like his master. What's his name? I asked the latter. He was cornered, and there was no way out of it. Thurber, he said in a small, frightened voice. Thurber and I shook hands, and he didn't seem to me any more depressed than any other spaniel I had met. He had, however, the expression of a bachelor on his way to a party he has tried in vain to get out of. And I think it must have been this cast of countenance that had reminded Mr. Stong of the dog I draw. The dog I draw is, to be sure, much larger than a spaniel and not so shaggy. But I confess, though I am not a spaniel man, that there are certain basic resemblances between my dog and all other dogs with long ears and troubled eyes. The late Hendrik Van Loon was privy to the secret that the dog of my drawings was originally intended to look more like a bloodhound than anything else, but that he turned, out, turned up by accident with legs too short to be an authentic member of this breed. This flaw was brought about by the fact that the dog was first drawn on a telephone memo pad, which was not quite large enough to accommodate him. Mr. Van Loon labored under the unfortunate delusion that an actual bloodhound would fit as unobtrusively into the Van Loon living room as the drawn dog does in the pictures. He learned his mistake in a few weeks. He discovered that an actual bloodhound regards a residence as a series of men's rooms and that it is interested only in tracing things. Once, when Mr. Van Loon had been wandering around his yard for an hour or more, he called to his bloodhound and was dismayed when, instead of coming directly to him, the dog proceeded to follow every crisscross of the maze its master had made in wandering about. That dog didn't care a damn about where I was, Mr. Van Loon told me. All he was interested in was how I got there. Perhaps I should suggest at least one name for a dog, if only to justify the title of this piece. All right then, what's the matter with Stong? It's a good name for a dog, short, firm, and effective. I recommend it to all those who have written to me for suggestions and to all those who may be at this very moment turning over in their minds the idea of asking my advice in this difficult and perplexing field of nomenclature. James Thurber How to Name a Dog
Well, my dears, I hope you found it delightful. <laughs> and now, what shall we do for next week? Well, I have that to, to find out. And we'll all find out next week. Thank you for being with me. This is Tales and Cocktails. Good night. <laughs>